Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I do like the uh, informal nature of being able to just chat about my favorite bird and, and things like that too. There's far too many of these meetings that I am on that are professional and we have to keep it together and keep our cool and <laughs> all that sort of thing. So it's, it's fun to be um, in a place where we can joke and have fun too. My, my favorite bird, I'll, I'll stick with that one. My favorite bird is the grasshopper sparrow. Um, it's a grassland bird, um, pretty widely found, widely distributed throughout North America. But um, one of the biggest reasons that I love grasshopper sparrows so much is that their, their song is so, I don't know, uh, amazingly unbird-like. <laughs> I really like insects as well. And so, you know, listening to grasshopper sparrows sing um, is kind of like listening to an insect. So I like them for that. Plus, I just hear them all the time whenever I'm working in grasslands, uh, which is the vast majority of what I do. And it's just a wonderful background to have uh, to all the work that I constantly am doing. So, yeah. <laughs> I will go ahead and share my screen. Um, we're going to make sure all this is working. And it looks to be. So, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, tell you about the work that I'm doing at Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, where I currently work up here in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, I, I am an avian ecologist with Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, and um, I'm also the coordinator of the MODIS network um, throughout the, I don't know, the, the Great Plains, Chihuahuan Desert, and the western half of the country as well. Uh, so what I want to tell you about is our project developing out this MODIS network throughout this region. And I want to also show you some uh, interesting um, data and tell you a couple fun little anecdotal stories of uh, some of the early findings that we've had so far. Um, I'd like to thank some of our funders and supporters. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, of course, funds and supports quite a bit of our work as well as helps plan out um, you know, as we develop this MODIS network in the region, we've been working quite heavily with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, especially in regards to their National Wildlife Refuge System. Uh, another big supporter and one of the funders of my position is Birds Canada. Uh, Birds Canada is a small nonprofit based in Canada, based in uh, Ontario, and they are the headquarters of MODIS, the MODIS Wildlife Tracking System. So they, they kind of house the um, servers and all of the knowledge and everything about MODIS kind of goes through them. So, yeah, um, let's see. All right, next slide. <laughs> As I said, I work for Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. We're a nonprofit based in uh, Northern Colorado and our mission is to conserve birds and their habitats. And we do that through a three-pronged approach of science, stewardship, and education. And we do work across the entire Great Plains and down into Mexico. So we're an international uh, nonprofit. And um, a lot of our work, though not all of it, a lot of our work focuses on grassland birds. And that's the, the birds that I'm gonna be talking about here in this presentation today. My work focuses on grassland birds as well. So as you may or may not be aware, grassland birds are experiencing some of the steepest declines of any avian guild. Um, any group of, of birds. Over the past 50 years, we've lost over half of the, uh, the number of grassland birds that existed um, in 1970. So they've experienced population declines as a whole, as the whole guild um, of over 50%. Some of the birds like the Baird Sparrow that you see here or Sprague's Pippet or um, Thick-Billed or Chestnut-Collared Longspurs are particularly steeping, uh, steeply declining um, species. And some of those have lost um, population numbers in the, the um, range of in the 80 to 90% of their populations have, have been lost in the past 50 to 60 years. So there's a lot, um, a lot of bad going on with grassland birds. So understanding the causes of those declines is extremely complex. It involves um, multiple uh, components of their annual cycle, under, you know, understanding those different components of their annual cycle. And it involves work that spans multiple continents. So the grassland birds um, breed as far north up into Canada, into the prairies of uh, 
Saskatchewan and Alberta and Manitoba. And they spend their winters down into Mexico, quite, a, quite far down into Mexico in a lot of cases as well. What you see here is the range of the Baird Sparrow, just kind of as an example of that tricontinental um, aspect of grassland birds. So there's a lot of components that go into a bird's annual cycle, their uh, survivorship during their breeding and wintering um, seasons, their re reproductive success, you know, the survivor between seasons during migration, um, et cetera. So trying to understand, you know, where declines are taking place is extremely complex. In uh, 2018, um, a partner, as well as others um, at, at F Fish and Wildlife Service published this publication. It's a full annual cycle conservation strategy for those four birds that I'd mentioned that are um, experiencing particularly steep declines. And in that uh, publication, migration was identified as a missing piece in the plan. And MODIS, the MODIS wildlife tracking system itself was specifically identified as a technology to be used to be able to fill in some of those knowledge gaps um, that exist during migration. So questions that we have at Bird Conservancy, and these are the gaps that need to be filled are, uh, you know, kind of, um, seemingly simple or seemingly broad uh, concepts such as where do grassland birds go during migration? What stopover locations do they use? What kinds of habitats do they use during migration? There's a lot of interesting data that shows that grassland birds don't particularly use grasslands during migration. And so is it really important to um, conserve, you know, some of these grasslands in the, the migration area, or is it more important to focus on uh, places up in the mountains? It's hard to know. We don't really know these things right now. Um, so that's where MODIS comes in. The MODIS wildlife tracking system, like I said, is headquartered at Birds Canada. Um, and essentially it's an automated radio telemetry network. It's a network of these telemetry stations coupled with tagged animals. So birds and other animals are outfitted with radio transmitter tags. And when one of these tagged individuals comes within about 15 to 20 kilometers of a MODIS station, a detection is logged at that station. One of the good, uh, one of the interesting and exciting aspects of MODIS is um, that we don't need to recapture the birds to collect the data. The data is collected at the station itself. So once we put the transmitter tag on this bird, uh, we just let it go, and as it passes the stations, the uh, data is collected. Another interesting aspect of MODIS is its collaborative nature. So the entire MODIS network works together. And what I mean by that is that our stations will detect not only just our birds that we tag, but they will detect other people's tagged birds as well, as long as they um, have registered those tags within the MODIS uh, system itself. And then other people's stations within MODIS will detect our birds as well. So what that means as we build out an entire network or as we are interested in just tagging birds is that everybody's system, everybody's stations are helping the entire process. So I don't necessarily have to install stations up in the Northern Great Plains, for instance, because there's a lot of partners, as you'll see soon, working up there installing stations of their own for their own particular research. But those stations up there will help my research as the birds that I tag um, move north up into the Northern Great Plains. So there's two major components of the MODIS wildlife tracking system. Uh, the first one is tags. Um, of course, the uh, transmitter tags that we put on the animals. So here's two examples of tagged birds, one on a grasshopper sparrow, my favorite bird, <laughs> and another one on a lark bunting, our state bird. Um, there are two manufacturers of tags. Lotech is a, uh, um, they've been making wildlife transmitters and uh, tracking systems for quite some time. And then a relatively new company called Cellular Tracking Technologies. Um, both of those companies make their own uh, their own tags, but our stations work with both of those tags. So an interesting thing about these tags is that they all transmit at the same frequency. So all the low-tech tags transmit at 166 megahertz, and all the CTT or cellular tracking technologies tags transmit at 434 megahertz. And that means that 
uh, what, why that's important is that all our stations have to be um, set up to listen for are just those two frequencies. So we have dedicated antennas listening just for those frequencies. Um, the way that a station identifies a tag um, and pulls it out, you know, knows that it's that individual tag and not a different kind of tag is that these tags transmit a small coded pulse. So they send out these bursts of, uh, of uh, transmission that are, um, that consist of pulses microseconds apart. And it's the distance between each of those pulses within each of those bursts that identifies each of the individual tags. And so as a station has that data and that data runs through the, uh, the MODIS servers, each individual tag can be pulled out of um, what that station collected. The tags themselves come as small as uh, 0.15 grams. And so they're, they're extremely small, can be put on birds like these grasshopper sparrows. But there are other, are other researchers who are putting them on um, animals such as uh, uh, dragonflies and monarch butterflies as well. And so, you know, these tags are quite small. The uh, small nature of these tags makes it possible for us to be able to um, put them on these tiny birds like grasshopper sparrows and baird sparrows as well. There are several different power flavors <laughs> available in tags, uh, battery and solar powered uh, tags. And um, newly, there are, there are hybrid tags, uh, tags that are solar powered, but also have batteries that recharge using those solar panels. So um, lots of different options for researchers to use. So of course, the other component of the MODIS wildlife tracking system are the stations themselves. And the stations wildly different from each other. I'll show you lots of pictures of our stations coming up here. But essentially what they are made of are these antennas. Uh, like I said, there's uh, two different kinds of antennas. They're just sit sitting there listening for those two different frequencies. Um, they are directional antennas called Yagis. Um, and what I mean by two different kinds of antennas are, are two different Yagis that are listening for the two different frequencies. We actually have to have um, different antennas listening for those different frequencies. One antenna itself, a directional antenna such as this, has to be tuned to be able to, be able to listen for that frequency. And it's unable to scan across such a wide variety of uh, frequencies to be able to listen for both. So we have to install quite a few antennas in order to uh, properly be able to um, pick up or detect these two different kinds of tags. Those antennas are um, attached to the station computer by cables, of course, um, and there's several different kinds of station computers, ones that you can purchase, you know, ready to install, but other ones that you could build yourself uh, using um, widely available commercial um, electronics components. The antennas and cables are attached to these software-defined radios. Uh, they're just this little USB dongle is what it's called, <laughs> just a little USB um, attachment, a little radio that um, listens or does what the software tells it to do. So the software defines what that radio does. And of course, these stations are connected to a power source. Often we're able to use existing power on site, you know, just plug it right into an outlet that's next to the station. But often we also have to uh, rely on solar. If we install a station out in the middle of a field, um, you know, where there is no power, we can attach solar panels and batteries and such to uh, power the station. And then all of the data that the station collects has to make it back to the, uh, the servers at MODIS somehow. And these stations are able to connect to internet and transmit the data automatically and um, the sensor station from cellular tracking technologies, which you see here in this picture, actually is able to use cellular connection too. So it has an onboard cellular modem um, that allows it to connect to internet um, in a remote area. So each of the stations are quite unique. Uh, they don't look the same at any, any two sites. And that's simply because we try to um, we try to use what we have when we go to a site. So we try to use existing infrastructure. 
And often what that means is that we use a uh, communications tower that might already be installed, such as you see here at Cheyenne Bottoms Wildlife Area in Kansas. This is a station we installed there on a communications tower. Or uh, we use existing infrastructure such as this utility pole that just happened to be standing out in the middle of a field <laughs> on this ranch just outside of Marfa, Texas. So you can see they look quite different. Here's two more examples down in uh, Greenbush, Kansas, in the southeastern corner of the state of Kansas. We're able to install our station uh, antennas on a uh, large communications tower, about 120 feet up that tower. This tower is owned and operated by the sheriff's um, department within that county. And they allowed us um, the opportunity to put our antennas on their giant tower. And then here in Fort Collins at our Fort Collins Museum of Discovery, um, I built this crazy contraption that you, <laughs> that you see on the right here um, with our, our antennas and the solar uh, power and everything. Everything's attached to the back of a wall on the roof of the building. So we you know, bolted all of this metal to the back of the wall and attached our antennas to that. So all the stations are pretty different from each other. But one of you know, the biggest thing that I try to do is to use existing infrastructure wherever I can. And the reason I try to do that is it keeps our job easier, makes it much more simple for us, but it also reduces our footprint um, as we're installing these stations. We're not you know, going through the um, rigmarole of installing lots of giant towers. We're not um, taking up much more footprint on the ground. But it also reduces the um, available perches that are available for predators of grassland birds, such as raptors and things. So if we utilize existing structures, those structures are already there and we're not increasing the likelihood of pred predation on grassland birds. So this is a map of uh, what the MODIS network in North America looked like in the summer of 2020. And that's about when we got started with our project here at Bird Conservancy. So that's why I show this map. As you can see, the, uh, the black dots are existing MODIS stations. The vast majority of them are in the eastern half of the continent. Um, there's not very many at all here in the Great Plains. And if we want to study the movement of grassland birds within this area, we have to install a lot of infrastructure, a lot of MODIS stations, in order to properly be able to answer the questions that we're interested in. So we got started in the summer of 2020. Um, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies has been working with grassland birds in a lot of capacities, both in the Northern Great Plains on their breeding range, but down in the wintering range in Mexico and uh, the Southern part of the United States for quite some time. And so we've been able to use, uh, we've been able to build lots of partnerships across that, that entire region throughout that time we've been studying grassland birds. So we've been able to use those partnerships to start our MODIS network development, um, building off of those partnerships. Um, you know, a lot of those, a lot of those partners already have ranches, already have properties that we can use to install MODIS stations. But we've also been doing presentations such as this one or uh, other partnership webinars such as the Partners in Flight Western Working Group. We uh, play a big role in putting those partners in flight Western working group meetings together every spring and fall. And those are a time, it's a, it's a group of um, all the avian ecologists and avian researchers across multiple agencies and nonprofits. And we get together and talk about, um, you know, avian conservation needs and things. Um, we've been able to use those meetings to continue to build connections and things to use for, for installing MODIS stations. In the fall of uh, 2020, we held our first planning webinars um, to get the ball rolling, to figure out where we should focus our efforts immediately uh, to install MODIS stations. And then um, for the past two years now, we've been installing stations and also tagging birds. And then we have an upcoming MODIS workshop in just over a month down in Arizona, where we're gonna be teaching a lot of researchers and agency folks to um, all the things they need to know to install MODIS uh, stations for their own use in the state of Arizona and beyond. So here's a quick timeline of what our plans look like. Um, everything of course depends on the COVID pandemic. 
um, because that really limits travel and such, obviously. Um, so we started, like I said, in 2020. Uh, throughout 2020, 2020 and 2021, we've been able to receive uh, funding from quite a few state um, uh, locations, I'm sorry, um, federal and um, other uh, funding agencies. We've been able to obtain funding from them for about 50 MODIS stations to start this off. Um, we, started, we started installing stations in 2020. We put four up that year. And just last year, we were able to do 15 um, stations throughout the year, you know, despite the pandemic. So that's pretty good. And then throughout this time, we've, we've tagged a few birds, 25 so far. We've got quite a few tags to deploy coming up soon. Uh, but we also wanted to be tagging some birds to get, you know, some initial data throughout the process. So going forward, we, um, by the end of 2023, we will plan to get, you know, the remaining of these 50 stations installed, and we'll be holding a couple MODIS workshops, and we'll be tagging a lot more grassland birds uh, to be able to answer, to begin answering these questions. Of course, we're always looking for funding opportunities, so we're going to continue to apply for more funding grants, more, um, you know, foundational grants and all sorts of things like that to continue to fill in this network as we move forward. We just received a new grant, um, excuse me, heard about it at the end of 2021 uh, to install 10 more stations in the Northern Great Plains. So our plans right now as they stand are um, that by the end of 2025, we will have the uh, Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert Network built out into such a manner that we can then start really getting at um, answering these questions that we're interested in and hopefully apply that knowledge that we gain to the conservation of birds. And uh, that will help to turn around these declines that we've been seeing. So throughout this process, um, because the MODIS network works as it does uh, in a collaborative manner where other people's uh, tags and other people's birds are detected by our stations, we're really trying to build this and design things for long-term sustainability. And we've learned a couple lessons throughout, um, throughout this time, throughout the past two years. In December, on December 15th, I'm sure you all remember, especially down where you're at in Colorado Springs area, you guys experienced a lot of the, uh, the wind much worse than we did up here in Northern Colorado. We had that big windstorm that swept through. Um, it swept through pretty much the exact area throughout Colorado, Kansas, Nebraska, where we had just spent the year doing all of our work. So as that windstorm was coming up and as it was happening, I was just dreading seeing what happened to all the work we had just spent all of our time doing. Here's a, an example of what happened at one of our stations. This is that station out at Cheyenne Bottoms in Kansas. Um, our mast simply folded over and uh, you know, if we're building, right. putting all of this effort into building these stations uh, for, you know, for long-term sustainability, we need to come up with better um, ways of doing so. So we've learned what to do. In this case, we, uh, we learned that the pipe we used for that antenna mast simply wouldn't hold up under 100 mile an hour winds. <laughs> um, whereas other stations that we installed um, did hold up and so, We've been using different pipes going forward um, and, and hopefully building them to uh, withstand the next 100 mile an hour derecho that our, that our region will experience. So here's our, our, our traveling workshop. We're able, we were able to purchase and uh, partners helped purchase this truck and trailer for us to be able to do the work that we do. We're able to take this trailer oftentimes yeah. right up to the base of a station that we're installing and just do all the work in the trailer of course, it houses all of our um, toolboxes and our workbench and things like that and uh, do the work right on site, even if it is a uh, station out in the middle of a field. So that's been pretty nice. Um, here's a couple pictures of some of the stations that we've been able to install over the past year. Uh, down near Lamar is up in the uh, upper left hand corner with the tarantula. The uh, Southern Plains Land Trust has a big property down there just south of Lamar. And we're able to uh, install a MODIS station on a communications tower that they had attached to a house on that property. 
course, while I was down there, it was right at the end of the tarantula migration, so I couldn't help but take pictures of tarantulas with our motor station behind it. <laughs> Apologize if you're a spider uh, phobe. <laughs> like I said earlier, I like insects and uh, those sorts of things, so I take lots of photos of those. <laughs> um, just below that one is our station at the Crane Trust along the Platte in uh, Nebraska. We're able to use one of their maintenance barns. It's a big um, shed that they, they park all of their fleet in, kind of a hangar in a way, and install Moda Station right on the side of that barn using a similar design as to what you saw me do at the uh, Fort Collins Museum of Discovery. And then on the right hand, there's Alamosa National Wildlife Refuge uh, down in the San Luis Valley. Uh, where we used an existing utility pole to hold our antennas um, and a solar panel and such. A couple more photos. Um, here's our station at Quivira National Wildlife Refuge, uh, where we installed it on a light pole right on a barn. This, this is in, uh, in Kansas, just south of Cheyenne Bottoms. Um, and then up north here in northern Colorado, um, on the Pawnee grasslands, there's the Central Plains Experimental Range. And we're able to install our, our antennas um, on this instrument hut attached to a neon tower. If you're familiar with neon, um, that, that stands for the National Ecological Observatory Network. It's a network of these giant towers that are just covered in sensors of all, si all kinds that um, measure climate change over time uh, throughout many, many different kinds of habitats. This one's on the prairie up in the Pony. So we've, we've been able to use lots of varied locations and a lot of different existing infrastructure to hold our antennas and hold our stations. So designing all of these has been kind of a headache because every single one is, is different than the other ones. There's not really two that have been there's a few with the utility poles. Those have been fairly similar, but there's really not two that have been exactly alike. So now I wanna take you through um, some of the interesting stories or interesting data that we've been able to show or collect um, early on, You know, only with 25 tagged birds. That's really not many birds. And with very few stations across this entire region, I'm surprised that we're getting much of anything yet with the birds that we've tagged, but We've gotten some cool things and I want to show you a couple of those stories. So I want to take you up to Soapstone Prairie Natural Area. This is one of my absolute favorite places here in northern Colorado. It's a uh, natural area owned by the city of Fort Collins. It sits on the border of Wyoming and Colorado, um, north of Fort Collins. And it is a perfect and wonderful, beautiful um, example of short grass prairie. The property itself is nestled right up against the foothills. So there's a little bit of the foothills shrubs that you could see right here in this photo with the Mount Mahogany and such, but it spreads down into the flatlands or the, the short grass prairie. And so we have a really cool variety of uh, habitats, a variety of birds and other interesting wildlife such as black-footed ferrets, um, bison and other things on the property here. It's an amazing place. If you ever get up here, you absolutely have to go visit. <laughs> um, it's actually our closest place to Fort Collins to be able to see cool grassland birds like thick-billed longspurs and uh, grasshopper sparrows and such. So this is our station up at, up at Soapstone. It was our first station we were able to install in this um, network in the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert. So we also go up there to do other work such as tagging grassland birds. So the, all of the birds that we've tagged so far have been tagged up at Soapstone. So on June 22nd, 2020, we went out on a really amazing, beautiful sunrise, set up our, um, our banding gear. And you can see in the distance, there's a crew of people who are also setting up some nets. Actually, I think what they're doing in this picture is uh, chasing off some some cows so that we can set up our nets. <laughs> um, and this next per next picture, we've, we've got our nets set up. So we set up our nets, our mist nets in the grasslands. We watch the birds. We try to find where the birds are that we wanna focus on. In this case, we are focusing on Baird Sparrow. So we look for the Baird Sparrow, we listen for them, and um, we try to see where they're moving. We set up the nets where they're moving. You might be thinking, before I get too further into this, what is a Baird Sparrow doing up at Soapstone here in Colorado in June 
well, yeah, they, it's a bizarre thing that has been happening. Uh, Baird sparrows have been found throughout Colorado, throughout Wyoming as well, um, way outside of their typical breeding range. And uh, Soapstone Prairie Natural Area itself has been uh, used by them as a breeding site. We've, we've been able to show breeding up there, find nestlings in, in lots of cases um, for the past several years. Uh, there have been Baird sparrows found just outside of Colorado Springs as well recently. It's a weird thing. We don't know what's going on, but we're hoping to be able to use MODIS as a tool to get an answer of what they're doing. So on June 22nd, 2020, we set up these nets. We uh, used playback to bring the birds to the net. And uh, hopefully as they're passing by looking for the intruder into their territory, they'll get caught in the net like this guy did. This is a Baird Sparrow that I'm holding in my hand on the left. Uh, we put bands on them. We take all the typical morphometric measurements such as wing length, uh, tail length and such and weight. And uh, on the right, you can see my colleague, Erin Strasser of Bird Conservancy here. She's um, attaching a, a modus tag uh, made by that company, Lotech, to this, this Baird Sparrow. She's a very deft tagger. She's got lots of experience tagging birds like uh, grassland birds. And so um, she puts the tags on while I do the other work. <laughs> and here in this picture where I'm staring at the bird and it's looking at me like I'm about to eat it, um, <laughs> you can see the, the tag antenna poking off the back of the bird. And you may think that seems pretty intrusive and that, may, that seems pretty long and ridiculous. Why are you doing that to this poor bird? Um, the tag itself weighs less than 3% of the bird's body weight, and that includes the antenna. That antenna is extremely flexible, um, you know, though it's very visible in this picture here, it is extremely flexible. The tag itself sits on the back of the bird. It's attached with elastic that wraps around its legs, and it sits between its uh, wings, kind of up, up above the bottom of its wings and above its tail, similar to how we wear a backpack. And the tags themselves don't interfere with the bird's ability to move or anything like that. Of course, we would not want to be um, interfering with the bird's ability to move and live. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't do this. But yeah, those tags are not as uh, intrusive on the bird as they may appear when you look at something like this. So this bird we tagged, like I said, on June 22nd. Interestingly, uh, on July 6th, that bird moved up into Saskatchewan for some bizarre reason. <laughs> um, in 2020, there were some researchers up in Saskatchewan who were studying the movement of shorebirds. I'll talk a little bit about them in, in a minute. Um, but this, this tagged Baird Sparrow was detected by two of their stations on the 6th of July. And then on July 30th, it was back at Soapstone. And this is an example of um, some of the nomadic behavior that, we've, that we know grassland birds um, exhibit. We know that they move around quite a bit within the season, uh, either breeding or wintering season. We don't really know why. It doesn't make sense when we compare that to the known ecology of other birds. Um, you know, we, we typically think of birds moving to the north for the breeding and moving to the south for the wintering, but Grassland birds in particular move around quite a bit. We don't really understand why at all. Um, this is an example of that. This is also a good example of if there were more mo modus stations installed before we put the tag on this bird, we might get a better understanding of the direct, you know, the route that this bird took and how long it took to get between each of these, these places, perhaps, you know, better getting towards what is that bird doing. So that's one of the interesting stories with the Baird Sparrow just going north, coming back, uh, you know, hundreds of miles during its, its breeding season. Um, this year, uh, in June of 2020, this year, last year, <laughs> 2021, June of 2021, we were able to tag thick-billed long spurs for the first time up at um, Soapstone. They're notoriously difficult to catch, but we were able to catch two that day, a male and a female. We put tags on them both. You can see the tag antenna protruding off of the back of the female on the right. Um, so those birds were tagged on June 15th. Uh, the male itself was detected for a few days after we tagged it. And then in August, um, it was detected again. And then every single day 
from the middle of August all the way through October 1st, that bird was detected at Soapstone. And we, we started to think, we started to talk amongst ourselves here at Bird Conservancy, did this bird pass away? Did it drop its tag? What is going on? We were sure that the bird was um, uh, either not tagged or, or not living anymore. And so we'd started you know, coming up with ideas of, could we go out there and track this bird down using handheld um, radio telemetry systems? And uh, what would that look like? That would be pretty hard to find this one bird in this giant property. So we got back to work. We were doing our job, doing what we typically do, installing MODIS stations. We installed this MODIS station at the Southern Plains Land Trust just outside of Lamar on October 19th. Um, and then just five days later, that male was detected um, at that station, which is interesting. It was very, very, um, you know, very lucky that we installed the station where we did in the time that we did because this bird was moving south. And so that let us know that that bird is no longer sitting in one place up at Soapstone. Uh, we don't have to send out the teams to look for a corpse. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but that bird is living and it was migrating. We don't really know at all what that bird was doing from June through October. Uh, it's typically most likely just living its life and, and we were trying to make sense of it. Um, but we had expected it to leave a lot earlier than that. And then on October 24th as well, just about um, nine hours later, it was detected about 90 miles south of our station at um, the Southern Plains Land Trust. The station that was detected on is part of a small network um, run by researchers out of the University of Oklahoma to study the wintering movement of longspurs, such as this thick-billed longspur. So we know that this bird was migrating on October 24th. We don't know if it left Soapstone on the 24th or if it left on the 1st. I just, we'd know that it was just not detected between those two days, but we know that on the 24th for sure it was flying and it was flying south like we'd expect. So just some very interesting things with the very small amount of um, stations and the small tag numbers that we've been able to put out. These are some, some of the interesting stories that we've been able to compile so far. Um, Here's, here's a map, it's a very messy map, I apologize. This is what I work from on a daily basis. Uh, this map shows our plans. It also shows existing MODIS stations, all these little tiny yellow dots. These are all the existing MODIS stations. You can see there's quite a few in Montana, Idaho, and along the West Coast now too. Uh, there's a lot of work going on in the West to expand the MODIS network. Um, and there's a lot of people also tagging lots of birds. And so some of our partners up in the Northern Great Plains have been putting modus tags on Sprague's pipits. And some of those Sprague's pipits have been detected at our stations that we installed just this last year too. So as we install stations, uh, the birds are being detected. Some of the Swainson's thrushes that people have been tagging up in British Columbia have been detected by our stations here in the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert as you know, not too long after we've installed those stations. And so, you know, as more stations come online, um, more data is going to come and more people will gain interest in using MODIS. And so more stations will come online. That's kind of how MODIS has worked in the past and how it continues to work. Um, I don't know how much more time I have. I see that it's about 10 till eight. Um, I could continue or I could stop right here. <laughs> uh, Tyler or, or. Maybe, I was, we've got plenty of time. If you want to keep okay. going, uh, maybe. Okay, cool. You know, for, you know, seven, eight more minutes, something like that. And then it's okay, just that, so we have time for questions. Okay, that sounds good. I just didn't know if the meeting was going to like end at eight or not. So. Um, no, I shouldn't. It shouldn't just stop, hopefully. Okay. Julie can answer that. <laughs> okay. So as we're looking at this map, let me just kind of explain to you what we're looking at. Of course, you could see the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert region oh, yeah. outlined in orange right oh, here. Sure. Um, okay. But also you see a lot of our plans, a lot of our planned station installs, these blue and purple and green and orange pins that are within that region. Uh, each of those are associated with a specific funding source uh, or, or specific plans that we have. The green pins up in the north, those are all partners 
uh, who are installing stations in the Northern Great Plains. These um, circle circles that are right through the middle, kind of going right down the middle of the region, those are national parks. We've been approached by um, national parks to install MODIS stations at some very important parks within this region, places such as uh, Big Bend and Teddy Roosevelt up in uh, North Dakota and Texas, uh, Big Bend's down in Texas and Teddy Roosevelt's up in North Dakota. So we're, we're working with lots of different uh, partners to install stations. U.S. Fish and Wildlife, of course, the blue pins you see are all on uh, National Wildlife Refuges. So there's a lot going on on this map. <laughs> I apologize, it's kind of a mess, but it is kind of cool to see because it, it shows you, um, you know, what's coming and what our plans are and, and how we work as well. Um, so like I said, there's a lot going on out here in the West and there are a lot of people doing uh, MODIS out here as well. One of my jobs, uh, especially because of the funding from Birds Canada is to coordinate efforts throughout the Western half of North America, kind of on a larger scale. And so I'll quickly go through some of the things that are happening in the West to give you context for where our efforts fit within the larger scope of MODIS. Um, our partner, Mary Whitfield at the Southern Sierra Research Station is installing lots and lots of stations throughout California to study specifically the movement of tricolored blackbirds. Uh, the number that you see here, number 247, that's her project number on the MODIS website. I would encourage you to uh, visit modis.org and look at some of these, these projects themselves as I talk about them. Um, Mary has also been extremely important for MODIS because she got it uh, involved or she got partners in flight involved in MODIS. She wrote a prospectus that created this MODIS initiative within partners in flight. Um, the MPG Ranch, one of my partners up there, uh, William Blake is installing stations throughout Montana, Idaho and the, the greater um, Northwest. He's also installing stations down in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec down at the uh, the most narrow part of Mexico between the Gulf and the uh, Pacific. More info can be found on their website, mpgranch.com. Some pretty birds that they're tagging, <laughs> common nighthawks and uh, common poor wheels and uh, Lewis's woodpecker as well. In uh, Western Canada, Birds Canada and lots of universities and organizations based in Canada are tagging um, Swainson's thrush and Dunlin and studying the movement of those. In uh, Central Canada, there's a lot of work going on to study the movement of shorebirds and other passerines, colonies, uh, breeding species such as uh, swallows and things. Uh, one in particular at University of Saskatchewan, there's a full annual cycle study going on of shorebirds such as um, Western Sandpiper that uh, stretches down into Chile and Peru where they have stations down there to study, you know, the birds movement during the winter as well as up in Canada, the birds movement during the summer uh, or the breeding season. Those stations are the ones that detected our Baird Sparrow, the ones in Saskatchewan. Here's their, their uh, couple pictures of the birds that they're working with, uh, tree swallow, western sandpiper. And of course, ours right in the middle of the United States, the Great Plains Chihuahuan Desert down in New Mexico that I told you about. And our project is number 281 on the MODIS website. Up in the Northern Great Plains, there's lots of people doing some great work up there. Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center and US Fish and Wildlife is kind of leading the big efforts up there, um, as well as Environment Climate Change Canada and Montana's uh, Wildlife Agency. And then down in the uh, Southern part of the Great Plains is this small network of stations I told you about that detected our thick-billed longspur. Um, based from Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center and University of Oklahoma, studying specifically the wintering movement of um, long spurs, chestnut collared and thick billed long spurs. So you can see there's a lot of organizations doing work out here. And we have meetings um, once a month with the coordinators of each of these efforts. Uh, we get together and have a several hour long discussion, just, you know, touching base with each other, keeping contact, uh, trading contacts that we've gotten, 
learning from each other as we have problems like this bent mast in the massive windstorm. <laughs> you know, we we learn from each other, you know, try to figure out ways of of fixing problems as they arise. So these are pretty important coordinating meetings that that I lead um, once a month. Some cool things coming up with US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, they've got lots and lots of wildlife refuges, of course, throughout the United States. And there is a push right now within US Fish and Wildlife to put MODIS stations at the vast majority of those wildlife refuges, especially out here in the, uh, the Western part of the country. Um, that picture on the, the right here is our MODIS station at the uh, Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge, just outside of Denver. And another cool US Fish and Wildlife thing that's up and coming are biologists who are based on the Department of Defense bases are interested in getting excited about putting MODA stations on those bases themselves. The biologists, um, or actually the Department of Defense bases are required under this, this uh, piece of legislation called the Sykes Act to promote planning development and coordination of uh, wildlife conservation within the base property. And so the biologists set at those bases are um, very interested in using MODIS as a way of monitoring the wildlife on that base property itself. So that's moving forward. Um, and one cool thing is that throughout all of this, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies is really the leader in all of these efforts, not just in the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert, but throughout the West really we've become a place that people look to uh, when they want to learn how to do MODIS, when they want to know more about what's going on with MODIS, um, they come to us. And so Bird Conservancy really has, we've placed ourselves really well as the leaders of MODIS throughout the West. So here's a, uh, a slide. If you like what you've heard today, and you wanna help with bird conservation, here's a link that you can join birdconservancy.org slash donate. And you can learn about ways that you can get involved in the work that we do there. And I wanna say thanks for giving me this opportunity to talk to you tonight. There's my email address. Um, and thanks to some of our funders, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and US Fish and Wildlife, as well as Birds Canada. And there's lots of other funders that I'm forgetting right now because their logos are not on the screen helping me. <laughs> but at this time, I'd love to take questions. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Thanks.